Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Callie. We're just going to wait for a few minutes while we let everyone in. We've got a long list of people in the waiting room. Thanks for your patience if you were in there for a little while. Thanks for coming early. Uh, and then we'll get started in a little bit. Okay, so we're still letting some people trickle in, but I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Callie Anderson, and I am an independent audio producer. I'm also the director of audio journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York, CUNY. Uh, I will be your moderator for today. And so how it's going to work is I'll start with some introductions of our uh, panelists, then we'll have a discussion followed by an opportunity for questions from this great live audience. Uh, for the questions, we have two volunteer CUNY graduate, of graduate journalism students, Megan Burney and Jackie Harris, and they're going to be moderating the, the, moderating the chat. So if you have a question, once we get to that section, type it into the chat and Jackie and Megan will be sort of voicing those questions and getting to as many of them as possible. Please keep your mics muted throughout the meeting, even in the question uh, section, just because we are such a large group. Too many uh, competing background sounds can just be a bit too distracting for everyone. Uh, okay, so now I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, Connie, if you're able to turn on your video, you could do it now, but I know that Connie has some internet. Oh, there she is. Okay, cool. Hi. <laughs> and I'm not sure why Lajef is, in my view, he's not up on the top row, and I'm not sure why we weren't able to do that, but maybe just wave when you get to, when I get to talking about you. And then uh, I'll, we'll all be talking soon and you'll know who we are. All right, so um, if you are having trouble because you are on the grid view, the one thing I may will say if you're new to Zoom is you can click the little view button in the top and it gives you the option of speaker view, which will allow you to see whoever is speaking really big, which might be the way that you want to see it. And that hopefully is the way that uh, we are going to be recording this. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to start with Latif Nasser, if you want to wave or just unmute and say hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And thanks for having, having me and us, Callie. Uh, no problem. Here. Thanks for joining Great. us. So Latif is a co-host of the award-winning New York Public Radio show Radio Lab. Uh, earlier this year, he also hosted the mini-series uh, The Other Latif about his Moroccan namesake, who happens to be detainee 244 at Guantanamo Bay. In addition to his work in audio, Latif is the host and executive producer of Connected, a Netflix, a Netflix science documentary series, and he has a PhD from Harvard's History of Science Department. Uh, welcome, Latif. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Connie Walker. Do you want to say hello, Connie? Sure. Hello. Thanks for having me. I just Thank want to explain if my internet is choppy or, or bad. I'm, I'm in quarantine. Um, in Canada right now in the country. So um, it's it's a bit slow here. Okay, well, so far so good. And if you disappear, we'll understand why. Uh, for those who don't know Connie, Connie, is, well, Connie Walker is an investigative journalist. Uh, she's working on a forthcoming, still secret as far as I know, podcast with Gimlet Media. Previously, she hosted the CBC News podcast, Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo which won Best Serialized Story at the 2018 Third Coast International Audio Festival. I think that might have been the first ever Best Serialized Story, but I actually didn't check that part. <laughs> so uh, she is Cree from the Okanese First Nation in Saskatchewan, which is in Canada, for those of you who aren't secret Canadians like some of us on this panel. <laughs> so, uh, and we also have Emmanuel Jochi. Would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. So, so glad to be here. Emmanuel is co-host as of this morning of Reply All. Previously was a reporter and producer with Reply All. Uh, congratulations. Before that, he produced and reported stories for NPR member stations and This American Life. Um, as a co-host of the third season of Serial, he was part of a team that received an Edward R. Murrow Award for their coverage of Cleveland's felony courts, uh, in which I'm going to talk to him about today. Uh, welcome. And we also have B.A. Parker. Parker, would you like to say hello? Hi. Uh, thanks so much for having all of us. This is scary. Right. <laughs> well, I hope that it won't be too scary. Welcome, very welcome to uh, our fun Zoom experiment. 
uh, Parker is a BJ Parker is a senior producer for the Cut podcast with Vox and New York Magazine. She started as a film professor at Morgan State University before receiving a production fellowship with This American Life. Uh, she's also produced for NPR's Invisibilia. Invisib I can never say that name. Invisibilia. Is that right? Yeah. Gimlet's Heavyweight and WNYC's uh, great show that is unfortunate no more, Nancy. So welcome to all of you. Okay. <laughs> so today I want to sort of talk about the, which is the title of this panel, this idea of sort of first person storytelling. And I guess I should start by just talking about what I mean by that and what I, I think most of us would mean by that. And the most basic sense is just about using the word I when telling the story on the radio for one thing. Um, and I think in a broader sense, it's sort of acknowledging as a reporter or as a host that you're there, that you're witnessing something, that you have your own reactions and thoughts about what you're hearing or seeing if you're reporting, and you have your own personal history and past experiences that might have a bearing on this. So uh, what I'd like to do is begin by talking about some specific times that each of you have taken this approach in your work, um, and then we'll kind of move on to some broader um, questions about how this all works after that. So Connie, um, I'd like to start with you, especially while your internet seems to still be working. Um, sure. I know that you spent like many years and I still work as an investigative reporter at CBC, which is a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And in that role, you sort of often had to take the more traditional, like invisible, impartial observer stance in your reporting, right? So, but in your serialized podcast, Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo, you're very much more a character in the story you're telling or you're really part of the story and you're using the first person. Can you just talk a bit about why you decided to take that approach uh, for this series? Um, you know, to be honest, like I, I feel like I've always been drawn to that approach. Like even when I was working in television in news, like there, there were some examples where I, where I did do that kind of first person storytelling. Um, for the show that I worked on, which was CBC News Sunday back in the day. Um, and, and when I got into more of the traditional kind of national news reporting, there's not a lot of space for that, obviously. Um, but but I, that's one of the things that I really love about podcasting is, is kind of the idea that you can kind of pull back the curtain and be transparent about the process of storytelling and the process of, of journalism. And for me, that's also being able to include myself and get to be a kind of human being in, in the stories and get to be able to include that. And, and, and I think that like, that's particularly important um, as well, because a lot of my reporting is about Indigenous communities. Um, and I'm an Indigenous woman. It's, it's something that obviously has, has always been really important to me in my work, um, but for a long time, there just wasn't the space to kind of explore that. And so I, I think that getting to bring that into the stories that I'm reporting about, especially violence against indigenous women and girls um, is, is really important because I, I feel like that is, you know, I think that that is actually something that kind of can help deepen the understanding and, and, and have people connect with the work in, in a different way. And, and that's really important for a community that's been so underrepresented or misrepresented in media. And, and that's why um, I really appreciate getting to do that uh, in a podcast. Yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to, you know, be able to just say like, I am also a Cree woman, you know, as you're, as you're writing this, how that felt differently than when you have to take the sort of more news reporter stance. Well, I mean, I feel like I get to be myself, like I get to be authentic, which is like, you know, I feel like when I'm reporting for like Connie Walker, CBC News, The National, it feels like I'm putting something on, you know, and when I'm podcasting, I actually just get to sound exactly like I'm sounding right now, hopefully. Um, but, but for me, like, like, like I said, like there, there were, like I was a reporter for 20 years at CBC and I would say for most of that time, there just wasn't space um, to tell our stories and there, and there wasn't interest. And like, I remember the first um, story I pitched about a girl who I knew um, from back home who had gone missing. And it was the same summer that another white woman went missing in Toronto where I was working at the time. 
And I remember that there were so many similarities about their cases. One, you know, there were both these young, beautiful women who kind of just seemed to vanish without a trace. And I pitched a story at the time, um, you know, because I wanted to, to kind of tell both of their stories because, but really get into how they were treated so differently in the media because the white woman who went missing in Toronto, she was on the cover of the national newspapers. Her story was covered by the national newscasts. Um, you know, people across the country knew Alicia Ross was missing and her family was desperate to find her. Um, but I found out about Amber's, um, the girl who I knew uh, from back home, I found out from about her disappearance in an email chain. Like this is before social media. Like her family was just like, please forward this. Amber's missing. They didn't even get local coverage. And I remember pitching that story and, and like wanting to examine why there were these two different treatments. And my editor at the time kind of holding up her hand and saying, this isn't another poor Indian story, is it? And, and that was the reaction. Like that was the, that was the attitude in the newsrooms at the time around telling these stories. And so when I finally got an opportunity to be like, given the space and the opportunity, um, you know, I, I felt like it made sense to bring my whole self to that and to, to really, you know, try to help people understand what the realities are for indigenous women and girls and, and, I know that because I, I'm, I'm also one of them. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna talk more about some of the ways you brought people into the reporting process in a minute. I just want to uh, also bring in, um, uh, I think next I wanna to talk to Latif. Uh, and so for those of you who know your work in Radiolab and now your Netflix show, which my, I, I and my whole family, my children are huge fans of. I'll give you a little shout out to that. My kids are really excited. They're like, we well, can actually <laughs> talk to the poop guy. <laughs> it's like, yes, I am. Um, that's happy because he has an that episode about my, poop. Yeah. Happy for that to be my I mean, claim. they're five and eight. So, you know, they're not, they're not, <laughs> you're not reaching all your highbrow stuff. But um, so in those roles, like you often play this role of like the enthusiastic guide to something fascinating, right? So there is that sort of first person, like, come with me while I show you something really fascinating. And then in your series, the other Latif, where you're sort of trying to unravel the story of this prisoner at Guantanamo Bay who happens to share your name. I found that when I was listening to, listening to that, it's, you're not just on a journey of discovery about this subject and this person. I also sort of felt like it crossed over a little more sometimes into being a bit of a journey of reflecting on and discovering some things about yourself and about this lot if. Um, and so I was curious about that and I wanted to know sort of how you decided how much to reveal about yourself and your own past while you were writing those episodes for that series. Yeah, it's, it, it, was, it was so funny just to hear Connie's uh, uh, response because that, that like, like willingness to want to be authentic, like that's exactly the opposite of my uh, experience. <laughs> um, I think for me, like I came from the world of um, so I was a history grad student and then kind of like, like trying to be a science reporter, basically. And those two worlds like of history where stories like begin and end before I was born and like science reporting where it's like nature, it's happening out there. Uh, I, it's not really about me. Like, like I would use my, and I'm very comfortable doing that, like using my enthusiasm to get people excited about it, but it's not a story about me. Like I'm, I'm happy to be your like curious fun guide but but it's not about me and then and then this story the other lot if you're exactly right like it it became uh about me in a way like i i had never done any story that was really personal in that way and i'd never talked about myself like about my own life really um in you know like 10 10 years of radio stories uh and then uh basically what happened was I wanted so desperately to do this story about a guy who I found with my name, uh, who was at Guantanamo Bay. But I, but the problem was I couldn't, I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't get any any of his first person stuff. And sort of as I was trying to report out that story, I had just just crumbs, you know, like I had nothing. And and what I realized was in order to kind of tell a 
a satisfying story about this guy or to try to kind of like, like what I, what I constantly felt myself doing was imagining, imagining, extrapolating from my own life to try to like fill in, like what were the choices that this guy made? And in, in, in a way it felt like the premise of the, of the story, this, the sharing a name, it sort of opened up a, a space for that to happen. And then, and then it was like, it was almost like, uh, tactical like it was like okay i we need to i i need to get from here to there and i need to imagine this or i'm going to say this plot point and i know it's going to sound really bad to a lot of people but then if i if i base it in my own story like that plot point will actually like some guy like dropping everything he you know he has and going to afghanistan to go help um in the in the in the 90s like that that would sound different if you came from where i came from um, then probably it sounds to most people. So, so a lot of it was like tactical. It was like, I, I don't, I don't have a lot to go on for this guy. So I have to kind of, um, and, and the premise allowed me to kind of dig in myself instead. And, and when I did it, it was, it was very hard and I did it sort of begrudgingly. And, and so often the, um, yeah, the, the kind of the, um, like it, it would be a, a sort of a, like a, almost like a, like a personal tug of war between me and my producers of like, okay, d should this go in? Does this feel like it's actually enriching the story and is helpful or not? And then also the other thing that happened, and this also was just sort of happenstancical, uh, was that while I was going through, while I was reporting this story, because it took several years, I was also becoming a citizen. And so that also, like it just, it just, it just became personal in all these ways. The way when I met his family, that became personal in a weird way. It just kept getting personal. And I kept like, uh, yeah, I, I, it wasn't something I'd ever done before. It wasn't something that I was at all comfortable with, but it just kept happening. And I kept had, having to do it, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's interesting, that idea of it being on one hand, like trying to build this authentic version of the story of how you're really doing it, but also from a, when you go to tell the story point of view, that it can be like what you said, like, tactical or just like a bit of a device in some ways right to like bring the people along with you like i think that's did you ever have something where you realized like this could be useful here but actually i don't want to put it in because it's still me and i don't know if i want to put that much of myself in there or how often did that actually become oh. like you said a tug that was every single detail like uh every single detail that we like i i would I would write something. I would sort of like, like the process was I would like write, a, I would like stay up all night and write like some big, long, you know, like essay basically, like uh, imagining like, okay, this is how this, this episode should go. And then I would send it to my producers in the morning and then they would, uh, they would like basically like edit it and, and, and then, and then they would be like, oh, great. And we can use this thing. And I'd be like, no, 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 that was just for you guys. Like I, I was just trying to help, you know, contextualize this thing. I don't think we should actually use it. And so, so, so much of it was like this tug of war of like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's the thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it ended up being like very, uh, I don't know when it, when it seemed to sort of reframe my like uh um my fellow producers or, or the other radio lab staffers like like when they heard it and it it like it meant something to them uh and it didn't just feel like some self-indulgent you know narcissistic like uh let me just tell you about my childhood um when it when it did when it did like like work then that was the thing if they could persuade me that it worked then i was sort of willing to seed seed ground over that you know p p part of my personal life in a way yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to figure out the when, when to do it, right? Um, I just want to also bring in uh, Emmanuel here. Um, yeah. I think I'd like to ask you a couple questions about your reporting for Serial Season 3, because when um, Latif was just talking about that whole idea of like when to put yourself in, I find that yeah. when I was listening back to that again, I heard it, you know, now it's been a couple, couple of years, I guess. I can't believe that, but um, <laughs> listening to it again this week, I was sort of struck by how in your case, which is sort of different than both Connie and Latif are sort of like, really, it's their journey the whole way along. You, in that series, you do this interesting thing where you sort of like appear like sporadically. And mm -hmm. I'm so intrigued because I feel like you took that almost like most minimalist first person <laughs> approach, right? Where like sometimes you're just like straight up reporting, you know, you're using first person when you're having to say like, we're in a car and a cop is watching us. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no way of getting around pretending you're not in the car. But I think there's like these other moments that I find really interesting 
where it's a little more heightened and in a normal non-Zoom meeting, I would actually play the clip, but I think that seems too, com we thought that might seem too complicated today. So I'm gonna do a weird thing and I'm just going to read a tiny bit of what you say. Um, this is not at all as wonderfully as you say it, mm -hmm. um, but there's a part in episode two when you're commenting on how a judge is talking to a defendant and you come in as a narrator and you say, if you're hearing a sharp note of, I don't know, racial stereotyping in Judge Gall's questions, an assumption on the part of the judge that this black family is rudderless and unstable and that all these kids must be different, possibly must be from different, possibly incarcerated fathers. Yeah, I'm guessing Terrell hears it too. I'm quite certain his attorney, John Stannard, hears it. So this is interesting to me because like essentially this is a little piece of analysis or context or like just acknowledging something that's there and i find it's sort of on that edge of like reporting can you talk a bit about that those kind of moments in that podcast yeah 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 so just to say i mean i think what was interesting about serial was that this was kind of like my first real big boy job like i was an associate producer on that show and my job is that i'd been pulled we were gonna we didn't know what the show or the season was gonna be we just knew that we were gonna embed in like the felony court system in cleveland uh and like they needed somebody who like was young and had no like family attachments and could move. And like, that was me basically. So like originally I was hired as like, basically like a glorified, like, I don't know, stringer where it was just like, uh, you're the only person that can be in Cleveland for a year, like every day uh, and go to all of these things. So just hang out in the courthouse. We'll send you the places you can go record stuff. Like originally, at least in my mind, I was not going to be in the show at all like reporting anything or really have my analysis on anything. What happened really earlier though, especially with this one judge uh, that we're talking about, Judge Gore, is that there was a stage when that story was going to be exclusively actually about the relationship between me and him. Because what happened is uh, I would go into his room in the early days of being in Cleveland, mostly just because uh, he put a lot of people on probation. Uh, he didn't put people, he was not someone who sent people to prison really, or really that much jail time. His big thing was probation. And we were really interested in that concept um, because on paper, at least you're like, oh, okay. Uh, this judge is doing in a lot of cases what like a lot of people say like we should do, which is like, you know, that like longer terms of incarceration don't really like statistically provide like, any difference in terms of rehabilitation, whatever. But Sitting in his room, I realized really quickly that like there was a big a big part of the reason he was doing that um, was that he was exerting his control on these people's lives in like a very different way, uh, in a very paternalistic way. Um, and what's more is with me sitting in the room versus like Sarah, my co-host, um, who's like a white woman in the room, he was much more open about all of his choices because he, I think, wanted to prove something to me. So it was this weird thing where from the first day I was in his courtroom, he was ruining all of my tape because he would basically be using people as real life examples to me in the courtroom to explain like his philosophy on like life, on like race, on like rehabilitation in this way that like, was like really kind of unsettling. I'm talking like literally, like there's those scenes in the in the thing that you talked about is he's going through basically probationary hearings um, for like a bunch of like 20 something year old like guys who, you know, I think it was like their first or second offense. Uh, and they're young enough that like their family's in the room. And basically he's trying to paint a portrait to me of like the sorts of people who come through his courtroom. Uh, and so, you know, I was there sitting in the courtroom just being like, well, dude, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just here recording. <laughs> like, I, you don't need to prove anything to me. Um, but when you listen to, like, what he was doing, essentially what this judge was doing was threatening, um, threatening, illegally threatening to, like, throw people who were on probation to him in jail um, if he'd heard that, like, they'd had a child out of wedlock. That was basically his big thing. Um, which, you know, is unconstitutional and immoral for like a bunch of different reasons. Um, uh, and it was one of those things where, oh, because he was mentioning me in tape so much while trying to illustrate this example, I had to go back into chambers and argue with him about it. And normally I think like 
for this American life story or a serial story, we wouldn't be so like, like hard hitting about a thing. But we have a rule, which is that like, you can only write something about somebody if you said it to their face. And the reality is that what was happening day after day is I was going, I would watch like things happen in the courtroom all day. And then I would go back behind into chambers and we would argue for like three hours about like what he just done that day. Um, and I mean, a lot of that tape, sadly, is kind of unusual. It's almost unusable. You know what I mean? Right. Because I'm just like so upset. Yeah, like, did, you, um, did you have stuff that you kind of thought you might be able to use, but when you heard it, you're like, actually, I'm actually too invested in arguing with this guy at this point? Yeah, a little bit. Like, too invested in argument with this guy at this point. But also, I think, I did, like, a first draft of that story. And um, I don't know, straight away, what, we were like, well, and I, I was pretty, like, for this, which was like, well, we're doing this story about like the justice system and these people who are like going through the justice system, uh, the people who work in it, the people who are moving through it. The thing that was so shocking to me about that judge and the things that happened in his courtroom were that like everybody sort of like stood by and watched it happen. Everybody was very used to sort of seeing the usual man in the usual place doing like the same thing. And there was an acknowledgement with this guy that, well, because he only puts people in probation, if you can withstand a lot of the racism and paternalism that he's spewing, then like, you just have to grin and bear it and you'll get through it. And I was actually, I realized, oh, that's, it's not so much a story about whether I can get through, <laughs> right? Like these arguments with this, this judge, like who cares, right? Like I have my liberty. I'm leaving that building every day and going home. Like, you know, being in that courtroom was very difficult. A lot of people who, you know, I was 23 then, and like most of the people coming through the courtroom were like the exact same age as me and look like me. But at the end of the day, like I wasn't them. And I wanted to be clear about that. I feel like in my reporting and I became just much more interested and Sarah became much more interested in like the ways in which like he was exerting his control and that concept of just like, you sort of have to get through it. Um, but there were so many moments where like it felt so weird not to say what I'd experienced or what I thought of that moment uh, that you have to pop in every once in a while to like say a thing like that. Um, and I got lucky in that because of the way the story had evolved, I could do that. And it wouldn't be like journalistic malpractice because I would do that and I could use his tape as a response basically um like in like in that story which is which is basically what you eventually hear um and we also just realized like you if you're reporting on people who are saying racist things you have to call out those things like i think that's journalistic malpractice if you don't do that um but also at the same time i think it's very important in some cases like to just play out the logic of some of these people just a little bit like when you hear his logic laid out he really, really, really is like making use of all the holes that I've given him to like fall into and like bury himself in, in this way that I think like, you know, as a listener, hopefully like is, is satisfying. Um, even if I'm not popping in every five seconds to say, well, like, this is racist. Like, if you don't get that. <laughs> right. You just need a few. Help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just I just a need, couple a few, reminders. need a few <laughs> reminders here and there. Um, it's like little yeah. this is racism signposts, like the old fashioned radio signposts, just totally. to keep people <laughs> on the same page. Totally. And yeah. also just, I think the important thing was like, well, how do we convey that this is happening every day in this way? Mm -hmm. And the easiest mm -hmm. way to convey that is saying, this is what I saw in this man's courtroom for over three months, almost every single day. Well, I mean, that's like the amazing thing about that series is that you were just there for so long, which so yeah. few journalists get to do, which was so, so incredible. Um, B.A. Parker, uh, I want to bring you in as well. Uh, listening to Emmanuel talk about that sort of experience of seeing some of these guys coming through the courtroom and sort of being the same age and, you know, seeing himself in them in a sort of degree and sort of similar to what Latif said, like you're seeing similarities with someone, even though you've got a different experience. I wanted to ask you about a piece I re-listened to of yours this week, which was The Miseducation of Castlemont High a great story that you reported for This American Life. Um, and that's about a, this group of high school students that get kicked out of a screening of Schindler's List and the many repercussions of that and what followed. 
And I was struck by how in that piece, since I was listening with this ear to how you're, you might be part of that story, you really do end up sharing your own memories of both going to the movies as a black teenager, but also of seeing Schindler's List for the first time as a teenager. And I want to ask you about that. Like what made you want to include those personal memories in your telling of that story? And, and what do you think that that brought to it? Um, I'm trying to, well, if the motivation behind the story, like when I had pitched it was I was legit just trying to figure out why I had to see Schindler's List so many times in high school. Like I had seen, well, in middle school and in high school, I'd seen it like twice and I'd talk to a friend about it and like, for two black girls in Baltimore, that seemed like a lot of times to see Schindler's List. And I just was trying to figure out like where that came from and like the research behind that led to like, oh, it was a, in, in the state of Maryland, it was like a government mandate. So we had to watch Schindler's List and it all dovetailed, um, dovetailed into this um, the story that I had casually remembered um, years ago because of a poem about um, like all these the, like all these wealthy white people came to this poor black high school, but no one cared that you know the the clocks were broken and that there was no toilet paper in the bathrooms and that like there's like systemic issues, and I like understood that one hundred percent and just immediately um, in going about this story and. I also feel like during like we have story edits where everyone gathers around and you play the tape and you play the the thing and through those conversations of me just like trying to explain stuff like why like why is this important I'm like well okay this is important because being in, like I have been like a black kid in a movie theater and watched white people recoil and it friggin sucks you like you and then I, I was like you know like when you get on a subway and you see like a group of black kids that come in after school and get on the train and you see a couple of white people like tense up like imagine that every day and so like having to explain that kind of thing and um i think that kind of feeling like then that kind of like passion i was trying to rationally explain in the story and it's also i'm, I'm thinking now like this is my this is my second radio story ever. And like my, um, you know, it was doing my fellowship and I was still learning how to report because I wasn't a reporter, like I came from teaching and um, just, le just learning how to be a reporter was from this piece. And like when I took, when I got the fellowship, like my dream was like a black lady, David Sedaris. And I knew that wasn't gonna happen right away. And so uh, like I was, they did the story and this was how I learned like what kind of style that I wanted to create and like what I, um, what I wanted to share. And like also to a point of um, what Emmanuel said of just like the thing that I had to learn the hard way, like if, like, cause um, this American's life's rule is like, if you don't say it to the person, you can't say it on the show. And so I learned that um, the hard way. Cause I interviewed, I remember interviewing a teacher in the studio, which was weird. And like a producer was there and the teacher was like, a, like an older white Jewish man. And he immediately said, well, cause I was trying to like talk to him and relate to him. He was like, well, you know, Parker, you're from Baltimore. You know, like, like you know that black people are allowed in movie theaters. And I didn't push back because I was green and I was nervous. And I was like, I was in a room with two, like two like older men and I felt like, like, oh, I don't know what to do. Um, and immediately, I was like, at the end of the interview, I was like, did you hear that? That guy was freaking jerk. And he like said these racist things. And he's like, yeah, but we can't, we can't comment on it now because you didn't push back. And I was like, oh, dear. So that was me learning that and just realizing that I don't have to, I don't have to focus on that guy. I don't have to focus on the teachers because that wasn't the goal of the piece. The goal of the piece wasn't the teacher. It was like me trying to find a voice for the kids because that's what I was fighting for this whole time was like, this was a moment in time where these adults were having these huge arguments above these kids' heads and no one was actually talking to the kids. And so I wanted to find the kids and talk to them and be like, I see you, I hear you. Talk to me, what's going on? And so I had to like be mad at myself but then also realize like it isn't about this guy 
and his preconceptions. It's about talking to these kids about what was um, important. And that's how I was able to like throw myself into it because like in the, I think in the end, I pushed for um, the young girl who like finally stands up to the, uh, the governor of California and they wanted to cut that. And I was just like, no, that's the best part. That's the reason, like, this is the time, like, a kid fights. Like, this, we need a kid that fights. And, and it's like, why is this important to you? It's like, because all these adults are, like, are spewing awful things at them. This is the first kid that finally is like, enough. This guy is bad. And that, I mean, like, I had to be like, this moment's important to me. And then I have to, like, voice that. Well, and that moment is so powerful in that piece. Like, the idea that, that was your second radio story, I mean, oh, boy. That's amazing. <laughs> and there's a lot of love for that story in the in the chat as well. I mean, yeah, I think I love that you push for those things for one thing. And I, I also just want I, everyone has questions for you. So I'm only going to ask one more question sort of to all of you before I open it to others. But the one thing I sort of am curious about is you and Emmanuel talking about sort of the This American Life rules about like when you're allowed to put your own point of view in. And sort of like Connie talking about like, oh, like now I'm kind of free because I crossed this thing of like, I'm not being the reporter and lot of trying to like balance reporting and this. And so all of it sort of is making me think about this idea that I've sort of heard from some journalists, like here we're in a journalism school virtually, right? That like, oh, like all this first person reporting, it's storytelling, it's entertaining or whatever, but it's not like, journalism you know like it's something else or it's it's narrative and it's you know it's, it's there to entertain but you by doing this kind of storytelling you're somehow um giving up some of your credibility as a serious quote-unquote journalist right so i i personally don't do this because i do this kind of work too but i really want to hear from the four of you before we open it to everyone like, how do you respond to that kind of pushback beyond sort of just being within a system that says, like, this American life, we deal with some of this idea of, like, here's our rule. Or do you have personal rules that you've made? Or do you just think that that whole idea, you know, isn't a thing? So if any of you want to jump in with that, that's my my one big question to, to all of you. Um, I guess I'll go first. So I feel very strongly about this. Um, I think we've all, to me, like, I think like first person journalism, if you use it in a correct way, can be like, actually, I think a lot more honest than what you're hearing. I mean, I feel like we've all heard, heard those interviews. Uh, I think there's one like, I, and I should start first just by saying, I like think the journalists of the New York Times are fantastic, like people and they do their jobs very well. And I'm a big fan of The Daily. Um, but I remember forever ago, there was an episode of The Daily where, um, you heard like, um, and what I remember it was like towards the beginning of that show and the thrill of the daily and of hearing that show at the beginning was like, right, you got to see behind the scenes and like see these reporters like kind of a little bit like away from the page. And I remember like there was an episode we did about Steve Bannon and like you got to hear like the journalist who was reporting that story, like talking with Steve Bannon. And I remember hearing the journalist who reported that story talk about Steve Bannon and then reading the article later and being like, wow, you are so pally with this guy. And that makes sense. Like, you know, he's reported on him. He can be sound friend. He can sound friendly to that person and not believe what they believe or like not have anything. But like, I feel like what we have to do often, especially in audio, when you're talking to somebody like you are on all the time. Like our relationship with that person is like, I feel like what you're hearing. And I think when you can be honest and first person reporting and like present that relationship, uh, to me, uh, that like is a much harder thing to do. And like to do that and to be able to tell a balanced story, to get what you need from those people while still holding them accountable to the facts 100% of the time that you're on the, on the mic. Like, I think it's even harder if you were to ask like TV people. Mm -hmm. um, like because they're constantly doing that um, so I feel like I don't know for me like that's a thing that I feel very proud of and sort of my sort of reporting um, I should also just say that this American life rule I think while it is super lofty is very utilitarian like the reason they have that rule is because uh, it's actually more entertaining it's more entertaining to hear me like confront somebody in tape uh, than hear me do it in writing 
like uh, there's a story I did earlier on this year for Reply All um, that covered like uh, the phenomenon that was happening like in the, I think it was like the first month uh, after sort of like the big wave of protests that happened this year started. Um, it was a phenomenon where white people were like sending black people Venmos as like weird forms of like reparations mm-hmm. almost. Uh, and, you know, I did an interview in that story with this one guy, Blake, um, who had, you know, who had like sent a payment to someone he'd sort of known in college. And like, I could have written about that conversation and I could have written about him and it would have felt really mean. Some people felt it was mean even when you just heard me talking to him in the conversation, you know? Uh, Like, I think there's an integrity to that that I feel like is very important. And I think Mm -hmm. hearing you, you as a reporter say, well, that feels weird to me. And here's why it feels weird to me. And maybe some of why it feels weird to me is based on my own experience. That to me is much more powerful journalism. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And I know that Connie knows that I use this moment from Finding Cleo as like a teaching journalism moment all the time. I think I've told you this before, where that idea that maybe it's more honest, that you can like pull back the curtain of like the journalistic process. So instead of just like doing all this reporting and then just presenting this final perfect story, right? That like, this is just the facts as we found them and you don't need to know what went on to get them and all that kind of stuff. Connie, I know that you have that moment in that funeral home episode with uh, Jill, I want to say. Yes, Jill is the the friend of Cleo's, where you kind of come upon her really suddenly and unexpectedly and ask her in the moment, can I record? And she says no. And then you have this great tape of you explaining what it felt like to finally find the person who's the subject of your podcast and to have this friend say no. Sorry. It was actually, it was, we were recording and we were recording right, her. Right. Like we walked in the funeral home recording. We're already we were recording. recording. We we're like, yeah. Yes, we're already recording. And then when she realizes that we're asking about her friend, somebody that she knew when she was in grade, uh, I can't remember, like they were 13 years old and her friend who died. And then she was like, are you recording me? And I was like, yes. And she was like, stop recording. So I did. But then when she started talking about Cleo and remembering the day that she died and how she found out and she was having a party at her house and Cleo was supposed to be there and then her mom got a phone call, I was like, I hit record again, even though she told me I I couldn't record her, I recorded her. And what was going through my mind was like, I can't not have this and maybe I can convince her later that that it's like that to let us use it. Um, And, and so I I hit the record button again. And I was really transparent about that. And I and I like get a lot of questions about it. And, um, and, and I think that yeah, exactly, exactly that. Like, I I think that for for me, so much of our reporting has always been, uh, especially investigative reporting, it's like you work on a story, you're working on it for, for months and months at a time. And then at the end, you say, CBC News has learned X and like you kind of package it together. And, and I think that especially around the conversations that are happening now around like the credibility of, of journalism and fake news, but also the conversations that are happening now around representation and about whose, whose idea of objectivity are we supposedly upholding in journalism. Um, you know, I, I think that for me, the way that that I try to, um, I guess, approach it or, or, or counter that is, is in being transparent, like maybe to a fault, <laughs> some, some people might say, but, but, I, but I think that that's really important. And just to get back to that question about, about objectivity, like I, I think that it's so important that these conversations are happening. I, I, I find it actually, like people have asked me that all the time, my entire career, especially if I reported on indigenous issues, like you're you know basically accusing me of advocacy in in terms of of the stories that i'm telling because i'm too close to them i can't possibly be objective about them and and i think it's it's so insulting and 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 i think that it's actually the opposite like so much of journalism is subjective and everybody needs to know that everybody needs to reckon with that and understand that and this kind of fallacy of objectivity is is actually hurting us and it's not actually helping make the case that we can can have uh personal uh reflections in the moment 
and include those and they can inform the story. And that doesn't mean that we're biased journalists, that, that actually everybody has that. Every single person doing an interview anywhere has a reaction, is having some kind of subjective reaction. So for me, it's really, it's, uh, that's what, another thing I love about this kind of storytelling is that you can actually include that and incorporate that. And, and I find it when I listen to it and, and when I get to hear that, like I appreciate that so much more. Yeah, so do I. I mean, I think if you, yeah, if you can make the whole process more transparent, then you, it almost helps the ethical challenges sometimes, right? That you don't, you're not trying to obscure this sort of should we, shouldn't have we moment that you experienced, you just present it to everyone. Okay, I have obviously millions of questions. I could talk to you all for the next five hours, but we have many other questions coming in. So I want to turn it to Jackie to tell us one of these great questions that you've seen come through the chat that you want to put to the panel or to a specific person. Yes, hello. Um, we've got a really great question from Maria. Um, how do you deal with the often presumed whiteness of your audience when making personal stories? And any thoughts on how to push past making contact content that is hand-holding for white people when institutions often don't understand that? Great question. Uh, would anyone like to jump in on that one? I can. Um... I think I, 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 I'm learning, I'm averse to any kind of thing that has like a collective we, because that automatically turns me off of listening to a thing, because I know that I am not the perceived we in a lot of these like large organization stories. But I have found that my stories in particular, I try not to assume or, um, like I just did a, like a, in February, I did a story for This American Life about the church I go to and how I feel uncomfortable because there are white tourists who are looking down at us in a prominently black Baptist church. And the first thing they said, like the, the, the suggestion was I should interview the like white tourists. And I was like, no, I don't care about them. <laughs> like they're not important to me and they're not important to the story. Like they're just, they're there. And so, um, like being aware of that, but also uh, just like not engaging in it because I feel like that that gives them more power than me when it's like it's my essay. Uh, so uh, doing that and figuring out who I want the audience to be, and even then, like I had a weird there was a weird moment after that where I like the story was mentioned in like a conservative publication where I, I got complimented on because of that, which made me feel a little weird. But, um, but yeah, there is this like ignoring that and being, just being aware of like, there are white listeners, but like, like they can come to the party if they want to, is kind of my thought now. Now that I'm like the producer of a show now, I'm just being like, they can come if they want to, they can not if they don't want to. I like that idea. Like, you're welcome to, to, to come along, but I think you, there was a line like that in that story, I think, like, when you were talking with the, um, maybe it was with the, the, the pastor or the reverend of the church. Mm -hmm. He said something about like, bring them to the cookout, but like, don't, don't worry about them. Yeah, they're, they're not, they're not important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Megan, do you have another one from someone that we can put to the panel? Yes. So I also want to say that these questions are being prioritized by the editor, by the <laughs> moderator, in terms of what this panel is about. So I'm very sorry if you have another question. We'll try to get to it at the end. Okay. So in that uh, respect, we have a question about workflow uh, from Vaughn. Um, and they say, I'm curious to know how you recommend getting started at first person storytelling. Um, what is an approach similar to documentary film where you go out and record everything and then stitch it again, uh, stitch it together afterwards, or are you scripting something and going out to fill the gaps? Good question. Uh, anyone have something to fill in about that? I, I mean, hmm. I have, I have something to say about sort of how, how, I have sort of traditionally at Radiolab and then also for the other lot that have done that and how it sort of flipped, which is that usually at Radiolab we do, uh, yeah, we try to, we try to go out and get all the tape first. You do all the reporting. You have to know the story to be able to, um, to tell it. Uh, and, and you have to know what order it happens in and you have to know, uh, yeah, what, what your, what your end, what your satisfying end is going to be before you sort of start the beginning. Cause that's, uh, 
uh, yeah, that's the best way to make a roller coaster, I think. Um, but uh, the for for the other Latif, like when we were doing something that for me what and what was sort of new territory, like really something that involved me so much. Um, it, it really was, it was such a back and forth. It was such a, like, like, dr like uh, we, we went out and reported what we thought was the story. And then so often, then it would require this, like this deep sort of mining and writing and talking and sort of brainstorming. And then it would be like, Oh, this kind of corner of my, my story as it, as it helps to like illuminate this story, like it, in, in bringing that up, what we realized is, oh, we want to talk to this kind of person. Like we want to, uh, and, and that, that just opened the door to so many more questions. And, and so it, it really did end up being um, kind of the second thing you were saying where, where so often, like I would be writing something and I would say, oh, wait a second, this, I, like I would really love to fill in something here as opposed to kind of like, and, and I mean, there's certainly um, aspects of both, but, but I was, I was surprised because, because almost always it's the first thing you almost always report and then you, and then you write around it. Um, uh, but, but in this case, it, it, it was actually surprising to me the degree to which it was like, I was almost, it felt like I was doing the reporting in myself. And then I had to kind of, I had to like find ways to buttress that in, in, in the world. I like that idea of the reporting is <laughs> partly in yourself. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, anyone else have anything to add on, on that before I go to the, the next question? I mean, I would just say like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it definitely depends, like a lot of kind of touched on, I feel like, um, what type of story it is you're telling, right? Even if it is from your lens, I feel like there are stories. And also just how much time and money you have to do it. I feel like that's the thing we don't talk about a lot, right? Like you can go sit in Cleveland for a year, not really knowing what your story is when you're serial, you know, you can just do that and you can pay people to do that. And you can take, I think what nice white parents, that was six years to make, right? Like most people can't afford that. Uh, I think your needs are very different if you're making like, you know, like if you're making radio lab, you're making a weekly show where basically, you know, you're, you're, you guys are basically scuppering most of like the pitches that are coming in that people are making. And, you know, the criteria for a pitch or even the first place, part of it, depending on the show you're at, right, is often like, okay, well, where do you see this going? <laughs> right? Like, this is a great premise. What's like the story that we're going to actually hear? Do you have things that you are, you want to find out that like, and I feel like those are the sorts of questions that will help guide, that help guide the sort of structuring that like Lata was talking about. Um, uh, that obviously, I think, yeah, if you're doing a quick turnaround story, like you, you just have to be able to, to do a little bit. Thanks for that. Uh, Jackie, do you have another one for us? Yeah, Rebecca asks, um, you've all shared such personal things about yourselves. Do you have any advice for do's and don'ts for producers to make you feel comfortable and empowered to share personal stories about yourself? Great question. Uh, does anyone have something there? Parker? I think, um, a lot of it comes with uh, trusting the space and the people that you're working with. That's a huge part of it. Like um, the story I did for Invisibilia was about like, I have a father and on my mother's side, a grandmother who both have dementia. And it was about being like remembered and forgotten at the same time. And I had to, like I was using all the, all the tape was personal phone calls that I had with my dad, with my grams and being comfortable enough to like share that and to have like these intimate conversations with my producer and with my editor and just feeling comfortable with that. Um, I think when there is like a reinforced humanity, because sometimes there is this, um, especially in storytelling, in radio, there can be a, a lot of just like, oh, I don't like this dad character. They're like, oh no, that's a real dad. Like there's like, it's a real human being out in the world. So um, like a big thing for me is like reinforcing the humanity. And it's also like, because a lot of my stories are so personal, it's also because I'm just genuinely scared of screwing up someone else's life. 
And so I'm more than help happy to like put my cell phone blast. Um, and so like that is just a rule. If if I if I'm like a or like a, a like a freelancer who's doing us coming to you to do a story feels comfortable to like share like just share the experience. It has to be like a safe space. It has to be an, an, an informed and compassionate space. I I I was gonna say the exact same thing. There's a, a kind of a you have to be feel so free and comfortable. It's it's funny. So so I I fully believe that. And then at the same time, I also believe that those people that you ha you have to kind of trust and and be willing to kind of give this sort of warts and all portrait and like just give literally a, like a, a chunk of your heart to. Um, you also have to. Um, not only trust them to kind of like see this part of you, but also you have to trust them to like make like ruthless uh, samurai sword editorial decisions um, to be like, nope, this is this this doesn't help us. Like this is not actually doing the thing you needed to do, or this is not working. And I know you care about it, and I know it's really important to you, but it actually isn't helping us on the like we're we're building a thing. And 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 I think like that feeling of like, oh no, that'll. If you tell that story, that's going to send people's minds in this other direction. Like that's not helpful. That's not helping the big mission we have here. And and so and that that could be a like a, that's a really good editor basically. But factoring in uh, sort of Emmanuel's uh, brilliant um, point earlier, like if you don't have that, if you're doing something yourself or you don't have that editor, um, it's like finding a friend who's like a friend you trust and a friend, but a friend who can be quite honest with you um it's like like that you you need that exact perfect meld of like someone who um yeah you kind of trust enough to like to to edit your thoughts in a way um that's 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 really really valuable and once you have that and once you like feel like you're clicked into that level of sort of confidence in the people around you um it makes doing this kind of work a lot easier because they're sort of saving you from your own worst impulses in a way I, those are both such wise responses. I also want to highlight there's an interesting little side conversation going on in the chat about this thing that Parker brought up about characters or subjects. My students will laugh because they know I have a whole bee in my bonnet about calling people characters and forgetting that they're humans. <laughs> but there's not a good term. I sometimes repeatedly say interviewees or people, but I actually, does anyone have a way of a term they use for the people in their stories that doesn't reduce them to subjects or characters? Does anyone have one to suggest for the panel? <laughs> We're all just in the same we, collaborators. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, it's a really good. I feel like we just, uh, we so often use their names. Like, it's just like, oh, this person and that person and that person. Right. But then the, the, the problem with that is because there's so many stories with so many people's names, we just butcher the names all the time. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, and then we'll say a, a, a totally different name. But but that's I mean, that's the that's the way I feel like we do it. Well, and it's got to be confusing when your whole story is about a guy with the same name as you. That's right. not an also, ideal system in that good case. Good point. Good point. <laughs> um, OK, I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, Megan, do you have one that we can uh, put to the panelists before we wrap it up? Just one more. OK, um, I think that this one kind of is a good talking point. Um, a lot of people were asking about, you know, the ethics and rule book of journalism as we know it and whether podcasting kind of lends itself to its own set of, of, of ethics and storytelling and uh, where transparency lies in first person storytelling as well. Kind of broad, um, but some good points there. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. I mean, I think what seems sometimes to me to be a little false about the like podcasting journalism thing is that essentially like what we're based off of is no different, right, than like documentary film, which those are very often seen as like journalistic enterprises, or like magazine stories. Like essentially that's what we're doing every week or like every month, wherever it is, you're writing basically a very long magazine story, only like you're hearing all of the voices. And I feel like a lot of the same rules like apply to both mediums. Uh, uh, and I think that's why you see a lot of journalists, uh, put a surprise winners, whomever, getting into journalism, because this is your book. This is your magazine. Um, 
But yeah, I think as we've already talked about, like I think there are definitely hypocrisies in like the way we talk about objectivity, the way we talk about like sort of like the royal re and like who we're speaking to and what the default like sort of expectation and culture setting is in these stories that I think should totally be ripped up. Um, but I don't know. I think like podcasting is very much within the world of like the, the wall book in a lot of ways. I remember when I started at This American Life learning that they cut the tape like the fact that an interview got cut and you could like switch things around. And I thought like, I was like, oh, that's, that's sacrilege. I was like, oh no, that's just how you make a podcast. Like that's just how things work. And so, um, yeah, like figuring, like just getting over that mental barrier, just like they didn't say that then. And like having to like fix that was something that I had to work around mentally. I, I think of I, I like I think of podcasting as kind of the future of, of journalism, specifically like investigative journalism. Like you know, having worked in traditional media for so many years, it just felt like our windows were getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And you know, having to try to cram a story into you know a, a one minute video on Facebook or two minutes or even ten minutes sometimes uh, is really challenging. And I think that the space that podcasting creates. Um, for being able to connect with people and give people the opportunity to empathize with people who they don't recognize um, is really important. And I also want to thank you for creating a space where, where we can talk about, like we're all representing communities and, and stories that don't get enough attention in these traditional media platforms. And that's what, what I think is so such a gift in terms of, of podcasting and and the case that's been made and proven over and over and over again that there is interest in these stories. These are important stories. These are stories that people want to hear, and we don't have to have the the traditional gatekeepers, um, you know, having to rely on their editorial decisions anymore. And and so yeah, I appreciate getting to to be part of this panel. And yeah, I'm I'm with everyone else. We should keep these conversations going. Yeah, any, I think, any last thoughts there, Latif, before we wrap this up? Um, I, 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 part of what I've realized is uh, being good at this job is like respecting people's time and ending interviews on time. And I, because I, there's so many people here, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Callie, for hosting us. Thank you, uh, the, the, the rest of the panelists. Like I, I, I was actually looking forward to this for so long just to hear what you all thought uh, about stuff and you did not disappoint. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just really, I'm really, really, uh, grateful to all of you. And, and I put my uh, email in the, in the, in the chat. If anybody has like further questions, I, I'm, I'm happy to, um, keep, keep gabbing. Um, but, but thank you really, honestly, this was like such a good idea for a panel and I'm, I'm, I was so flattered to be part of it. Well, okay. thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we will be doing future events, uh, through the audio journalism program at the CUNY graduate school. You can follow me, you can follow the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism if one of the students wants to put our main um, CUNY uh, Twitter handle in the chat, that'd be great. And yeah, we've got to let everyone go because they've got to get back to making all these amazing audio stories that we love so much. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to everyone else for taking time out and adding another Zoom meeting to your day. I know that takes a lot these days. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And that's all for today.